Hello, I'm Joe Graber, and today we're going to be talking about curvilinear motion with normal and tangential coordinates. Hopefully, you've already watched the first video where I introduced normal tangential coordinates and arc length. If you haven't, please go back and watch that now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's set up normal tangential coordinates. I'm going to create a random path. And you can picture a particle uh, moving along this path. I'm going to put that particle right here at this snapshot in time. And now we need to figure out what are our UT and our UN. Setting those up is a big part of solving problems. The UT is always in the direction of motion, perpen or not perpendicular, tangent to the path. That's why the UT is called the tangent. OK, so we're going to call that our UT, tangent to the path in the direction of motion. And then perpendicular to that and pointing towards the instantaneous center of curvature is our UN. Okay, and of course that's pointing towards what would be the center of a circle that would approximate that arc. And you can label the radius of that circle as rho. Okay, so we've set up our UT and our UN axis. And now what we want to do is we want to figure out what are the coordinates in the UT and the UN. If you think back to rectangular coordinates, we have i, j, and in 3D we have k. And those are three unit vectors. Um, for these, we're, we have to figure out what components do we have for position, velocity, and acceleration. For position, in rectangular, we would typically have an i and a j in 2D. However, those would describe the distance between the origin and our point. What is the distance between the origin and our particle for normal tangential? Of course, it's 0, because our origin is always on the particle. So for position, we don't have a vector, 0 ut, 0 un. Okay? For velocity, would we have a vector? Sure, we have a velocity, but which direction is it pointed? It's always tangent to the path, and so is our ut. So that means our velocity vector is always in the ut direction. So we have a pretty simple vector for velocity. We would just say our velocity vector is equal to the magnitude of velocity, whatever that is, uh, multiplied by our ut. What's the component in the un direction? Zero, because that ut is always changing to match that motion. So we just have one component for our velocity. Looks like you can't really see the hat there. This has a, ha a hat over it just to call it a unit vector. Okay, so that's our equation for velocity, and I think I have that up here as well. So you can see it over there. Now let's talk about acceleration. For acceleration, we have that same equation uh, for velocity, uh, the magnitude of velocity times ut. But we also know our base kinematic equation that relates acceleration to velocity, where the acceleration is equal to dv dt. Let me put that up here. Acceleration as a vector is equal to the derivative of velocity as a vector with respect to time. OK, now we can just plug in our velocity vector for that v, and that would be the derivative of velocity times ut dt. OK, now you notice that we're taking the derivative of a product, so of course we have to use the product rule. Uh, the product rule tells us that d v u t dt, let me put parentheses here, it's going to be equal to the derivative of the first term, dv dt, times the second one, plus the first term times the derivative of the second. Okay, that wasn't so hard using the product rule. Now what we have to do is figure out what it means. The first term, I think we know what that means, dv dt is the rate of change of velocity in the tangential direction. The second term, we have velocity, but then we have this dut dt. Let's tackle that. Let's figure out what is dut dt. And to do that, I'm going to use my, um, well, we know the definition of it. dut dt is the, rate of, the instantaneous rate of change of the vector ut with respect to time. We have the vector ut right here. So let's look at what that vector looks like an infinites just a, a, a millisecond later. The particle is now over here, and I'm exaggerating it so you can see the differences here. And we have a new, of course, a new ut that's now tangent to 
this new part of the curve. I'll call that ut prime. Now, prime doesn't mean derivative of, it just means related to. Uh, and then we also have our new row, which would look like that. Since this is a really, really small change, we can say those two rows are going to be the same or very, very close. And as uh, the limit as it approaches 0, they're going to be exactly the same. Now all I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three unit vectors, un, ut, and ut prime. I'm going to put them with the same, their tails in the same location. So here's my un. OK, here's my ut perpendicular to it. And then my ut prime is coming out this way. Yeah, looks like you can see that. OK, so what is dut? Well, it would be the change. That would be the, the vector going from the original unit vector to the new unit vector would be our dut. Now we just have to figure out how do we calculate that? Like, What's the magnitude of it? What, it's not a unit vector. It's a change in a unit vector. OK, and we're going to do that using our arc length trick that we, that we learned in the previous video. So if you can picture this, up here we have a circle. We have a radius that is sweeping through a given angle. Uh, that angle is a small change in theta. We're just going to call it d theta. Okay, so that angle is d theta. If you notice, as that row sweeps, it's also going to change the angle of our ut and u, ut prime because it's perpendicular to those. So hopefully you can see that as our row sweeps, it's going to be the same sweep for our ut and our ut prime. So this angle down here is actually d theta as well. And now we're going to use that trick, arc length trick. If we look at dut, and we picture that as an arc instead of a straight line. Okay? We picture that as an arc instead of a straight line. What would be the magnitude of that arc? Well, it would be the radius times the change in angle in radians. That's the definition of arc length. What's the radius? Well, these are both unit vectors. What's the magnitude of a unit vector? 1. So the radius is 1 and d theta. So we can say with arc length that dut equals d theta times 1. Okay. Now these are scalars. Um, I haven't put a direction in yet. This is a scalar equation just saying the magnitude of dut is going to be equal to the magnitude of d theta for very small thetas because we're looking at the difference between an arc and a straight line. But the limit as it approaches 0, these are going to be the same. That's the magic of calculus. We can make some proclamation. And then the limit as it approaches 0, they are exactly the same. So we have dut. The magnitude of dut actually equals our d theta, how many radians we've swept between those two points. Then if we look at the drawing, what direction is our dut facing? It's not in the ut direction. It's perpendicular to it. What's perpendicular to ut? Un. So this is actually in the un direction. So our dut is going to be equal to d theta in the un direction. And now those are both vectors. OK? We can go ahead and plug those in. And what we end up with is that dut dt is equal to d theta dt times un. Let's plug that back into our original equation here. And we can see that we have acceleration equals dv dt times ut plus v times uh, dut dt, which we know is d theta dt u n. OK, I'm going to pause for a minute and clean up this area. Just give me some more. OK, this is a very useful equation. But let's make it even more useful by taking out this d theta dt. Now, d theta dt we will be using uh, when we move on to rotational. Um, but here in the particle assumption uh, part of this class, 
we would rather have that in terms of position, velocity, or acceleration. So let's see how we can do that. Uh, d theta dt, we want to relate that d theta to a change in position. And we can actually do that using arc link a second time. If we look up at this original drawing, we have a d theta. We have a row. So what would be the length of this arc right here? Well, it would be rho d theta. And what are we going to call this arc? Well, it's a change in position. Change in position of our particle is a ds. Okay. So with, with that, we can look at it and say, well, ds is equal to rho d theta. Solve for d theta equals ds over rho, which is the same thing as 1 over rho times ds. Let's go ahead and plug that in for our d theta. OK, so I plugged in my 1 over rho. I just put the rho under the v. And then my d theta dt turned into a ds dt. What is ds dt? Rate of change of position with respect to time? Well, that's one of our base kinematic equations. We can put it over here. Velocity is equal to ds dt. And we can put a velocity in there. And we end up with the equation that we've been looking for, which is acceleration in the normal tangential is going to be equal to dv dt. times ut plus v times v, which is v squared, over rho un. OK, this is a very important equation. We have just been able to take what we knew intuitively and turn it into some math. What do we know intuitively? We know that we're, when we're in a car, there are different forces we feel. If they hit the gas, you go, you go backwards because the velocity is changing. And you feel that change in the tangential direction. Okay? So the dv dt, that's hitting the gas or hitting the brakes. Okay? That's your forward and backwards. The v squared over rho, that's perpendicular to it. When you go around a corner and you're thrown this way, you go around a corner and you're thrown that way. Perpendicular to motion. And you can see it's just related to how fast you're going and how sharp the corner is. So we've taken what you feel in a car and we've been able to separate it out into these mathematical equations. I'm going to Pause for a second and clean off the board and go on to a couple of special examples. OK, let's consider a couple of special cases. We have the equation that we just derived up here. And we're going to talk about two special cases. First one, what if we're traveling along a straight line? If we're traveling along a straight line, uh, our velocity could be changing. So our dv dt is still there. So in that case, our acceleration, we know that first term is there dv dt ut, because our velocity might be changing. The second term, what's rho on a straight line? We can think about it. We get bigger and bigger circles until that arc gets lighter and lighter. Rho would be infinity. So we'd have plus whatever our velocity is over infinity un. And of course, one over, anything over infinity is 0. So we end up with just the one term along a straight line, which makes sense. This is the term that we've been using uh, even for a rectangular in our rectilinear motion, dv dt. OK, our second case, the particle moves along a curve at a constant speed. OK, for that constant speed, our dv dt is going to be 0. And of course, our acceleration for this one would just be the second term, v squared over rho times un. OK, the one more thing I want to talk about on this video is what happens in 3D. In three-dimensional motion, we need three unit vectors, just like we had i, j, and k. So far, we only have two, u, t, and u, n. And as this particle is moving along a plane, you know those u, t, and u, n, they tilt back and forth as they go. Okay. In 3D, it's the same idea. You have your ut and your un, but they can tilt in all directions. That ut is always going to go in the direction of motion. Okay? So as this plane, which is my finger, moves along with the particle, 
it's oscillating. It's going back and forth depending on the direction of motion of t. We call that the oscillating plane. The plane containing the n and t axis is called the oscillating plane. Here's a picture of it from the Hibbler text. You can see that the ut and the un, which I'm using my fingers to show, as it oscillates around, we're actually going to have a third unit vector called the binormal direction, or ub. And that's going to be perpendicular to that plane, so pointing out the top. As it oscillates, all three move. That binormal direction is perpendicular to the plane, and it can be determined using the cross product. We know the cross product of two vectors creates a third vector that's perpendicular to it. That's also how you can determine the sense, whether it's going up or down. However, there's no motion in that direction. Why not? Because that's how we set up our coordinate system. The t is always going in the direction of motion, and this plane is always oscillating. So there's acceleration in the t and the n. There's motion in only the t. There's nothing in the binormal. Zero all the time. This is actually very useful in solving a lot of problems. So it's, uh, it's, it's a useful piece of information. We have the UT, the UN, and the UB, and I'll show you in some examples how we can use that. Uh, hopefully you learned something from this video. Please let me know if you have any questions.